Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, we'll now be listening to Rory uh, for a few minutes, after which um, he will take us upstairs to, do, to speak further about one of the works in When We See Us. Over to you, Rory. Thank you. Um, yes, hello everybody. My name is Rory Tsapai, one of the fellows, obviously. Um, and today I'll be talking about my research project that I did this year, um, which in the context of this symposium is described as transmedia, but is also known as a brush with the lens, uh, thinking about photographic practices in contemporary black figurative painting. Um, and so maybe just to foreground a little bit about myself as a scholar and a thinker. Uh, before this year of honors study at UWC, I previously studied uh, journalism and art history and have kind of consistently had a real academic interest in photography, um, in photographic images and camera technology, all these types of things. Um, and so when I was asked to uh, square my research with an exhibition of 100 years of figurative painting, I was a little nervous and a little uncertain of how to uh, speak to my personal interest in one medium whilst sort of thinking in the context of another. Um, but actually, it's been a really generative exercise thinking about the thing that I care about most, photography, within the context of a painting show. Um, and so this year of study has sort of made one thing very clear to me, which is, as an art historian, the things that I'm trying to emphasize most are material, technology, and practice. And basically, the reason that I'm doing this is because I feel like when we are thinking about art, when we're thinking about artists, it's very easy and very common to think about biography, to think about the content of an image, which is something that I think When We See Us does really well. It really thinks about what these are pictures of, where the artists are coming from, the times that they were practicing in. But something that I felt like I could enter into the, uh, the knowledge base of the show was a slightly closer um, interest in uh, the materials and practices that went into painting the paintings that are in the exhibition. Um, so what I'm going to do now is take you through just a few of the things that I was thinking about that connect to these ideas of material technology and practice um, and show you how it all came back to, to painting and photography. So we're going to begin in 1938 um, in Astoria, Queens, New York, where the uh, world's first uh, xerographic copy was made. Um, I'm sure you are all on some level familiar with a Xerox machine, or as we typically call it now, a photocopier. Um, but the reason I was thinking about this technology is because it's actually a really interesting type of photography and a technology that sort of transformed the way we relate to media and images, especially in the latter half of the 20th century. Um, yes, so on October 22nd, 1938, uh, an American man named Chester Carlson and his colleague Otto Corne developed a uh, xerographic technology. And so xerography comes from uh, the Greek for dry writing. And basically what was really interesting about this technology was for the first time you could make a copy of a document or an image uh, without any liquid, without any fluid. So it was a much cleaner process. And without getting into the nitty gritty of how these machines work, what's basically important to know in making a xerograph is that a negative image is, okay, so you have a charged electronic plate, um, which is exposed to light. And the areas that are not exposed to light are, um, they don't pick up, sorry, let me start again. So you have uh, an electronically charged plate, sort of like a plate of metal, which is exposed to light, which is coming off of a document, an image. And so all the areas that aren't hit by light are basically the parts of the image that, that exist, right? So it's from a negative to, so you create a negative image on an electronic plate. And then because only some areas of the plate are charged, the xerograph machine uh, deposits a powder toner onto the charged areas. And so basically you have dry powder adhering to uh, surface because of static electricity and then that dry powder is placed onto a piece of paper and there you have a photocopy. Um, <laughs> and so uh, after 
making the first Xerograph in 1938, it took another 21 years uh, for the first sort of commercially available Xero Xerox machine to be introduced in 1959. And that's what you see there on the right hand side. And basically this technology really revolutionized the workplace, but also sort of people's day to day relationships to copies, reproducibility, images, all these types of things. And the only reason that I'm getting into this very specific machine history is because there is a really fantastic Nigerian American artist named Jideka Akunyili Crosby who is not only featured in When We See Us, but also uh, in Zeitzmoker's collection show, Two Together. We have one of her paintings up there too. And so one of Akunyili Crosby's sort of signature practices is what is the Xerox transfer. And so the way that a Xerox transfer works is once you have a xerographic copy or an image, you soak it in acetone, place it face down on another piece of paper, and you burnish it or you rub it so that basically that dry toner powder that I mentioned before is uh, aided by the acetone is able to be transferred onto a piece of paper. And so you're able to make a copy. And so the thing that I was thinking about here is you have on one hand the technology of the Xerox machine, which kind of automated copy making and sort of heralded in a new age of technological reproduction, wherein the labor of making a copy and of making an image was sort of reduced to just the pressing of a button. And so what I'm then interested in is how Njideka Kunyili Crosby kind of brings back the manual labor and the hand into this gesture by using these xerographic transfers. And so you have a machine made image that is now being turned back into a manual image. And something that I was thinking about in terms of when we see us is why painting? What is a painting show? What is a painting? And I came to this idea that I think Xerox transfer can really be framed as a type of painting, right? Because sort of at its base, like with all painting, you have a powder pigment being suspended in a solution, being worked by the human hand to create an image, right? So even though it feels a little bit distanced from dipping the paintbrush into the palette, it is, as I'm understanding it, a very similar gesture. Um, and so... It's this really interesting moment of returning the hand and returning manual labor into photography and into copy making, which are increasingly automated practices. Um, furthermore, Judeka Cornelia Crosby is an artist who's really interested in photography in general and does a lot of really interesting work thinking about photographs as they are able to contain uh, personal and public memory. So what you see on the left here is a detail from predecessors number three uh, which is the work that's in the collection show right now. And basically, can I go forward? That's the full painting on the side. And so this is just a small detail of the painting, but it's a hand transferred photograph of a photograph made to look like a photograph in the space of the painting, if that makes sense. Um, and so even though Judica Cornelia Crosby is a painter, she's doing this really interesting work in sort of thinking about how photographs hold personal memory. Her most valuable possession, she says, is her family's photo album, which dates back to the early 1960s uh, when her family was living in Nigeria. And then in her own lifetime, she relocated to the United States. And so some of the stuff that I was thinking through around her work is what is the importance of the family photo archive? And particularly, why is it that photographs are understood to have this historical value, this memory value, that I would argue other media don't have the same? You know, there is something about looking at a photograph and we understand it to be a memento, we understand it to be a record of how life looked, how life actually was. And something that I want to trouble there a little bit is, sure, we can think about photographs as sort of these faithful recollections of the past, but also we must understand them as like incredibly staged things as well. And so sort of beginning with Akunyili Crosby's own Nigerian heritage, I was thinking through uh, West African studio portraiture traditions in general. So here we, for example, have an image by Seydou Keita of a family portrait, uh, it's like a 1950 made in Mali, um, which is quite similar to the family portrait that's presented in Akunyili Crosby's own work and the images to be found in her photo album. And so if we sort of move away from thinking about photographs as these sort of faithful, recolle faithful recollections of how the world looks, we can also maybe think about photographs as opportunities to imagine bigger, better, more beautiful versions of ourselves or photographs and photography as sort of an aspirational technology as well. 
And that's something that Akunyuli Crosby is really interested in her practice as well, is sort of trying to figure out how to create scenes that bridge the different aspects of her identity, her Nigerian experiences, her American experiences, experiences of racialization and being put in different class structures between these contexts. And so what she does is she creates these really interesting tableaus where there's kind of a whole blend of different references all locked into one image. So the image that we have on the left, for example, the table that we see in the foreground, that's from a photograph that the artist took shortly after her grandmother's death, visiting her grandmother's house. And that was sort of just a table of homewares, important items. There's a lot of interesting things on that table. There's a lamp, there's bowls for serving food and for washing your hands. There's a picture of Jesus. There's some small family portraits. But then in the background, uh, the table and the couch are the, and the rug are the artist's way of referencing some of the uh, more American aspects of the domestic space and sort of uh, this like mid-century modern aesthetic and all these types of things. And um, as you can see on the sides of the image, uh, these areas that like look shadowed or you might see the, uh, the breeze blocks or the, the wall with holes in it on the side, all those spaces are made up of photographs, whether transferred or collaged. So what I was really thinking through in her practice is how can the photograph be the material of memory? How can it be a bridge between different contexts um, and different experiences? And how is it also implicated in this work of sort of self-presentation? And even though there are no sort of explicit figures in the Akunyili Crosby work shown here, of course, there are, there's a clear figure in the one in when we see us. I was also trying to think about how can we think about a work like that as something figurative and in relation to work by the Ghanaian photographer, Philip Kwame Apagia, who uh, has made this like really charming and uh, quite famous series of photographs um, in his studio in Accra, where basically he had a selection of painted backdrops of domestic spaces, airport runways, nightclubs, mansions, all sorts of sort of aspirational spaces where for a very small fee, you could come in and take a photo and for a moment sort of pretend that you were part of a lifestyle that you don't actually live. And I thought it was very interesting that in order for Kwame Apagia to create that illusion, he turned to painting to sort of bolster his photographic imagination. So this was just sort of some of the stuff that I was thinking through in terms of trying to draw connections between two media that at the start of the year, I was unsure how they might gel together. Um, but another important part of this year of fellowship has been working in the registrar's department uh, under the fantastic registrar Lee Burgers. Um, and so a lot of my work this year has actually been incredibly rewarding because it's been really hands-on work. And so in August, I was lucky enough to uh, inspect and condition report three paintings which are in the Zeitzmacher collection, three paintings by the South African artist Neo Matloga, who is also featured in When We See Us. Um, and obviously, you know, if someone's thinking about painting and photography, Neo Matloga is a good person to go to. Um, because one of sort of the hallmarks of his practice is he creates these collage paintings with the collaged elements being snipped pieces of, of photographs of black figures. And so I was thinking about his work on two fronts. The first I'll mention quite quickly. Something that I think having a background, having studied uh, South African photography, particularly from the latter half of the 20th century, um, I have a lot of these images in my brain from practitioners like Santumo Fouquet, Paul Weinberg, Ruth Mutai, people like this. And looking at Neo's work, I kept being reminded of photographs that I'd seen in other contexts. And so I became very interested in what happens when a photograph is being referenced or maybe even more like obliquely referenced in a painting and sort of how, again, thinking of what I was saying about Judeca as well, how photographs have this kind of memory capacity, but also this relationship to truth that painting doesn't have. And so what can happen if we sort of take inspiration from a photograph to create a painting? How might we and how might Neo Matloga sort of create a scene that is both like historical in its affect, but also totally imagined? Um, but the thing that I want to focus on most right now when talking about Neo's work is uh, the gesture of photo collage. 
um, which something that I'm always trying to do as an art historian as well is sort of understand precedents and understand contemporaries and sort of think about other artists who are working in similar ways. So what we have here are a few works, uh, the first from 1964 by Romare Um I'm trying to zoom my eyes in on this presentation. It's called Pittsburgh Memory. Uh, the second work, sorry, my captions are a little mixed up. The second work is a 2017 collage by the American artist Deborah Roberts. Uh, the third is a digital collage by the late South African artist Lungantila. And the fourth is a detail of Madeira, which is uh, the painting of Neos that's included in When We See Us. And so, I was really interested in this gesture of photographic collage and what it means to sort of break up the uh, the wholeness of a photograph to create a new whole. You know, we might think of the, about the photographic image, like I was saying, as this sort of uh, document of reality. But now what happens when practitioners like Bearden, Tila, Roberts or Matloga sort of rip up that reality and constitute their own new space? And, you know, sort of thinking within the context of black figuration and figurative practice, I was really drawn to some ideas from Franz Fanon's black skin, white masks. And so these experts excerpts are from a section of black skin, white masks, which is quite famous, um, wherein Fanon describes this moment of being uh, identified and racialized as a black man in the street um, when a young white boy sort of calls out look a negro sort of upon spying fanon and this is sort of a a mind explosion moment in which he sort of comes to realize that no matter who he is in the world he is sort of overdetermined from the outside by his blackness so he writes i was responsible not only for my body but also for my race and my ancestors i cast an objective gaze over myself discovered my blackness my ethnic features deafened by cannibalism, backwardness, fetishism, racial stigmas, slave traders, and above all, yes, above all, the grinning Iabon Benania. I am overdetermined from the outside. I am a slave not to the ideas other have not to the idea others have of me, but to my appearance. And then slightly later in the text, still talking about this moment, he writes, My body was returned to me, spread eagled, disjointed, redone, draped in mourning on this white winter's day. And I felt like this text was incredibly suggestive for thinking through Neo Matloga's work um, for two reasons for these two highlighted sections. So first of all, uh, this reference that he makes here to the grinning Iabon Banania, it's to a uh, banana flavored chocolate drink that was available in, mostly available in Western Africa during French occupation. It was uh, sent with French soldiers as a quick source of sugar and protein and you know something, it was a dry powder drink that you needed to only add water or milk to drink. So it was, it was a practical thing for colonial soldiers to have. But the branding decision that was made in, uh, in marketing Banania was to have this uh, smiling black figure or a tirayo senegalese, which is basically um, a colonized black subject who was made to fight for the French military, whether on the continent, in Europe, or further afield. And so the Banania figure is kind of a super reductive stereotype of this docile, manageable, happy to be colonized black figure. And um, it's sort of, so when Fanon makes this reference, he's sort of saying how, as people see him, as the external gaze understands him as a black subject, uh, is sort of in this incredibly reductive way. And so from the Banania image, I was reminded of another famous artwork uh, by Kerry James Marshall, whose imprint is sort of felt throughout when we see us, even though his work itself is not included in the show. And so this is a portrait of the artist as a shadow of his former self, a sort of breakthrough painting by Kerry James Marshall made in 1980, and interestingly understood art historically as the moment that he turned away from collage and toward painting. And so what Kerry James Marshall is trying to get at in this painting is sort of his thinking, okay, if the world wants to understand blackness in this way and make it such a reductive, dehumanizing category, then he's going to lean all the way in and sort of say, okay, if you want black, I'll show you black. So he's painted this figure, portrait of his former self, um, basically in various shades of gray and black, with the only difference being the collar, the eyes, and this kind of menacing grin of the figure, um, which can sort of be thought to reference the sambo or minstrel traditions of, of depicting black figures. And so... Kerry James Marshall, in response to this kind of externalized white gaze, reductive gaze, 
is leaning all the way into blackness. But then what I find interesting is we can look forward then to a work by Neomat Loga from 2017 from his Black Collages series, which is kind of understood as his turn away from painting and towards collage, so kind of reverse gesture, um, as also a way of thinking about how we can uh, challenge reductive images and visions of blackness. So instead of leaning into the literal shade black, what he's done, he creates these really interesting collages, which I'm trying to call underdetermined figures in response to Fanon's sort of idea of overdetermination, where basically because the figure is made up of little snippets, little fragments from other images, i.e. from other people, it sort of loses any specificity and becomes kind of general, but also becomes something entirely new. Um, and so I was trying to sort of think through that gesture and, um, yeah, how the photograph with its links to reality can now be used as an imaginative device to sort of counter overdetermined external vision. Um, and this is something that the artist talks about himself, which is sort of that if the predominant view of blackness is a distortion, then he himself will create a distortion to counter that. And of course, using collage and photography in the process. And a text that I kept coming back to during this work uh, was this really interesting essay, Art History as Collage, by the American art historian David M. Lubin, who writes that collage does not respect classical unities of time, place, and tone, but rather introduces foreign entities, sometimes jarringly, assaulting the integrity of the well-made homogenous space. Collage is a messy, irregular, trial-and-error enterprise with no predetermined outcome. It is playful and disrespectful. It's inherently fun. And so this is something I was really trying to think about this whole time was like, how can we be playful? How can we be disrespectful? Not only as artists, but also as art historians. And so sort of after Lubin, I've tried to bring in what I would call uh, art history as collage or a collage epistemology into my art history practice, which is finding pieces from all over, whether the histories of Xerox or French chocolate drinks and connecting them to a uh, contemporary black painting that's present in the museum today. And because of that presence, I would like to finish my presentation uh, by talking to you about one more work that is a real central piece of my thesis. But instead of projecting it on a screen, I would like to invite you all to come with me to level three to the Joy and Revelry Gallery. And I'll talk to you about a painting up there. Yeah.